subscribe, like, comment and share to support the channel. Thank you for the support. There are three middle names within the Baskerville clan. Van is given to those from the extended lineage, Lou is given to the males from the direct lineage, the middle name given to the females from the direct lineage, but isn't frequently seen as most Baskervilles are males, is La. Our new little sister introduces herself as Pomerian La Baskerville. The cure continued to be shocked upon hearing her name. He couldn't believe that she had the middle name of La, as there shouldn't be a lot of people who bear that middle name in the family. As the cure remains stunned by this new information, Ian points out something to him and tells him to look at it. She recognizes the emblem as the symbol of the cure's clan the Baskervilles. The cure soon takes notice of the necklace and grabs it from Pomerian. His sudden action startles her as he said excuse me while grabbing the necklace. Seeing the necklace up close causes the cure to be startled again. He opens the necklace which reveals a family portrait that the cure couldn't believe. He sees that Hugo Le Baskerville was standing in it along with two other members of the Baskerville family. He pulls the necklace closer to his face to see it more clearly while wondering why Hugo was in the picture, but he soon realizes something as he pulls the necklace closer. Pomerian was shaking in fear due to his sudden actions, but this doesn't stop our boy as he begins to interrogate the sweet little girl. He lets out his bloodthirst, asking Pomerian about who the people were in the picture as well as her connection to them. Ian cuts in and asks Vakir how he expects to get an answer from a kid when he responds like that. She tells him to ask her while smiling instead. Vakir thought about Ian's advice and knew that she was right. He couldn't hold back his emotions because of how shocked he was, and knew that this sweet little child had done nothing wrong. Vakir then asks the same question to Pomerian about who the people in the picture were but this time he asks her with a gentle smile on his face. Ian looks in him and couldn't believe that her slave was able to smile like that. That comment made Vakir kind of annoyed. Pomerian then took a moment to answer. She then points a finger to the picture in the necklace, telling Vakir that it was her mommy, grandma, grandpa. Hearing the word grandpa made Vakir realize something. He recalled what Butler Barrymore told him that might have been true. A flashback is seen from when Vakir was younger. He was confused by Butler Barrymore. As they walk through the estate, Barrymore informs the cure that he may not believe him, but the clan head Hugo used to have a very loving and gentle personality. The cure couldn't believe that Barrymore was referring to the scary Hugo that the cure knew and tells him that he didn't know how many people within the Baskerville would believe that. Barrymore further explains that in truth, the clan head loved the first wife Lady Roxana very much and cared for her dearly, although Lady Roxana passed away from illness. That wasn't the reason the clan head's personality changed. When the soul bloodline created between Hugo and Lady Roxana, Lady Penelope was taken away by barbarians. That was the tipping point. Hugo then began to move swiftly to find Lady Penelope. Due to this, he requested the Emperor move him to the frontier, and the Baskerville house that used to be within the archipelago was moved to the mountain Le Rouge et Le Noir where the barbarians lay hidden. But no matter how many hunting dogs he sent, he wasn't able to find any traces of Lady Penelope. As time passed, without being able to even confirm the life or death of Lady Penelope, the clan head ended up being filled with rage and sadness that caused him to cry tears of blood over the loss of his precious daughter. After that incident, Hugo's rage against the barbarians neared madness, and he became a cold calculating killing machine that lived only to destroy barbarians and demonic creatures. The cure thought about how he ignored Barrymore's story of Hugo because he just couldn't believe it due to its absurdity. But upon seeing the appearance of Pomerian in front of him, she was the living proof. Penelope is the daughter of Lady Roxana, the only woman that Hugo loved, and the daughter of that Penelope is Pomerian. If the cure had to guess if he was correct, then it meant that this girl here was Hugo's direct granddaughter. If Hugo, who currently treats her own children as tools while raging against the barbarians, saw his granddaughter who has barbarian blood mixed into her, what expression would he make? Wondered the cure. He soon places his hand on top of Pomerian's head to comfort her. He noticed that she wasn't treated well within the Rococo tribe, so he tells her to come with him. Pomerian's eyes and mouth open wide as she heard Vakir's words. Vakir continues to smile at her, thinking about if he was smiling correctly as she hadn't said anything yet. But she soon points out that her mom, hair, eye, same. Vakir tells her yes, as all the Baskerville hounds look similar in that it seems like he was her uncle. Pomerian repeated the word uncle as she continues to gaze at Vakir due to their similarity. She then looks back to the grave that she had built and placed a flower on. A flashback is seen where her mother, Lady Penelope was coughing badly due to the plague. She tells her daughter that if she ever sees someone with red eyes, then she must follow them. 
Pomerian continued to stare at the grave while thinking of her mother's last words to her, but her action catches Vakir's attention as he looks down. Pomerian was holding onto his shirt. She calls him uncle and tells him that she wanted to come with him. This was the moment when the two stragglers of the Iron-Blooded Sword clan had crossed paths. The scene changes to the tent that Vakir had built for Ion. A cutie pie pops her head out from the tent, asking her uncle about where he was going. Lads we must protect her at all cost. Comment below if you wish to protect this sweet thing. Vakir tells her that he needed to go since he had a meeting to attend to as the matriarch had called for him. Pomerian wails out loud as she chases after Vakir, telling him that they should go together. Vakir agrees to her request and carries her up with his arm while thinking if she was scared of being alone. He thought about how it was great that she opened up, but looking after a child was harder than he thought. But there was nothing he can do. Vakir looks back at Pomerian who had nested herself onto his back. Her face was filled with joy as she hugged Vakir as he carried her. As Vakir walked through the village to the meeting, he thought about how he couldn't raise her in the Balak's village. He needed to raise her somewhere Hugo's eyes can't reach, in a place where the Empire's civilization grazes. He looks back at her and could see that she was sleeping and snoring peacefully. This made he think about Chihuahua and to ask him for a favor. Vakir also noted that he needed to leave the forest and stop by the city later. We soon arrived at the matriarch's tent. She was alarmed to find out that there was an infectious disease going around. She tells the people who had gathered in her tent that it was bad. Since the rainy season was approaching, if the disease is still present during the rainy season, the damage done would be even more lethal, but the shaman elder shouted out to her that it was not a disease, but a curse instead. The elders on his side agrees with what he said. They continued to tell the matriarch that lifting the curse would solve it and that they needed to perform a large ritual, but Ian argues back to them, telling them that it couldn't be a curse and that they needed to leave the village and relocate immediately, but the elders on the shaman's side didn't budge from their argument. They question Ian about how they could dare to abandon the scared place where the ashes of their ancestors rest, so it made relocation out of the question. They further argued that this was Balak's land, and that it was where they have lived for 200 years. The younger generation of leaders on Ian's side pushed back against the elders. They argued about the chance of the disease spreading all over and killing the children, and further states about their future, saying that their future generations will disappear if they continue to try looking after their ancestors' graves. The two sides continued to argue. The elders on the shaman's side continued to state that it was a curse and that it happens when you eat a strange mushroom, adding on that the ancestors were enraged because they had been neglecting their graves. Another elder was convinced that it was Bug that was spreading the disease. The elders soon asked the matriarch to choose, but all she could do was remain silent as the two sides continued to battle against one another. The Kir sat at the back of the meeting with Pomerian sleeping peacefully on his lap, so freaking cute. He thought about the Red Death. He knew that the infectious Red Death was comparable to the Black Death that had spread throughout the Empire. This formidable disease was rampant and had spread to the Empire's border. The reason why the Empire was safe was due to Camus from the Morgue clan. She had casted a firewall to stop the spreading of the disease. It was also thanks to Dollars, the dispatched female saint from Quo, Vadis. With the help of her powerful divine power, they purified the disease. However, that treatment method was only restricted to the Empire. Most barbarians who lived in the La Rouge et Le Noir mountain would die, but that was favorable for the Baskerville clan since the barbarians who played an important part of the forest's ecosystem disappeared, a monster wave occurred due to the influx of low-ranked monsters. This resulted in an exponential increase in the number of casualties among civilians. The Baskerville clan, who protected the borders, received support from the Empire and started to subjugate the monsters. In the end, they were successful in protecting the border, and it became an opportunity for Hugo to further establish his political position. The Kir then raises his hand up to catch the matriarch's attention. He tells her that he had a way to stop the Red Death. As the Kir refused to witness that Hugo, a pair of green legs with three toes on each foot is tied upside down by a rope as it struggles to free itself. The green figure was then dumped into a pot of water. The rope that was tied onto its feet was pulled across a tree branch. It is revealed that there were a bunch of barbarians who surrounded the green figure as it was lifted up from the water. The barbarians were wearing a cloth on their faces as they exclaimed in wonder over this experiment. Upon closer inspection of the green goblin, they realized that it had contracted the red death after being dipped into the pot of water. The barbarian then tosses the green goblin that had the red death into a fire. Ian was happy to see that all the goblins that they had shoved into the infected water contracted red death. It all went accordingly to what Vakir said. She then asks him if the red death really transmit through water. 
the cure tells her yeah. He explains to her that the infected water was the biggest cause of the infection. But once they boil the water, there shouldn't be any problem. Ian smiles and looks at the three other green goblins that they had captured, thinking that boiled water was fine. Seeing her happy expression and what they did to their comrade causes the remaining green goblins to be startled. Soon enough, one of them was tied to the rope once again and lowered into a boiling pot of water. It lets out a scream as its head enters the pot first. As soon as they pulled the green goblin out of the boiling water, Ian points out to it and tells Vakir that it had died immediately. Vakir tells her to put the green goblins into the cold water with a I can't believe this dumbass did that kind of face. Once again, the remaining green goblins were dipped into the cold water that Vakir had asked them to do. The tribe members couldn't believe that it was true. Even after some time passed, the green goblins didn't contract the Red Death. The tribe members were happy to have found a way to conquer the Red Death as the answer was water. They also asked that if they were to drink boiled water, they could prevent the infection. The matriarch appears with a smile on her face as she tells Vakir that he had done a good job. She informs him that it was thanks to them that they were able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and for that she was grateful. But Vakir warns her that they couldn't let their guards down yet. He explains to her that the water cannot enter their eyes or any mucous membranes, as the Red Death can be transmitted through the respiratory system, so the tribe needed to be careful when the fog is present at dawn. Ian could be seen teasing the shaman over what he said about how the Red Death was supposedly a curse, all the shaman could do was grunt as he did nothing to help, but he soon questions Vakir on whether the solution to the Red Death was just to avoid water as the rainy season would soon arrive, he then asks about how they should avoid the waters when it happens, Vakir tells the shaman that what he said was true, that when the rain comes, there will be an overflow of water from the river and the air will become humid. There will be limitations to the methods of how they could boil water and wash up as they go according to the preventative measures. Kind of sounds like they have COVID. Hearing Vakir agree with him brought a smile to the shaman's face as he was right for once. But then Vakir tells him that they needed to relocate the village. Hearing that causes the shaman to be startled. He yells at Vakir that he had already told the tribe that they couldn't leave the place where their ancestors lie. He then questions Vakir if he was choosing to ignore the words of the Council of Elders. But Vakir remained determined with his words. He tells the tribe that there was a method such that they won't have to move from the Balak territory. The rainy season approached the Lurugi T. Lenoir Mountain as dark clouds filled the skies with a heavy downpour of rain. The river flooded, and what was once flatlands became vast torrents of swampy terrain. Within the deep forest, the torrential rain was something that even the elderly had never witnessed before, and that's how everything within the deep forest became flooded. Massive amounts of water covered the land as only the tops of the trees could be seen from above, all except for the Balak village. The tribe members could seen shouting to pull harder and tie it tighter as they held onto a rope. The tribe members continued to shout at one another to raise the fence, so that it could be stabilized and wouldn't fall down. It turns out that the Balak tribe had relocated to live on top of the trees, just like the Ewoks from Star Wars. The other tribe members talked about how with this much rain, the village didn't get flooded. The other tribe member looks up and tells him that it was all thanks to a certain someone. The two tribe members soon shouted out at Vakir who stood above them. They thanks him for not getting the village flooded and thought about how great it was for them to have listened to him. Vakir continued to think about how it was a good thing that there were many tall trees within the Balak territory, which made it possible for them to be able to endure the rainy season. Pomerian then pokes her cute little head out of the tent, calling out to Uncle Vakir that she wanted to be with him. So cute. But something soon catches Vakir's attention as he looked down. He yells out to the two tribe members that it was dangerous. As a massive shadow in the water with glowing eyes approached the tribe members who were still waving at Vakir, the massive shadow soon comes out of the water. It was revealed to be a gigantic sea monster. The two tribe members were shocked to see this massive beast coming towards them. They screamed in horror as its massive teeth reached closer to where they were. But somebody else was quick to react as an arrow is being drawn. A powerful blow manages to land itself right onto the gigantic sea monster's body that causes its face to go like, WTF, Ian had appeared with her bow in hand, get lost, you damn catfish, said Ian. Vakir then asks her if that monster was the Mashusu, Ian explains to him that it was the one known to be the king for dozens of years around this area. She tells him that the tribe calls it Ka, it kind of looks like a mix between Garritos and Magikarp from Pokemon, comment below what you think it looks like. But the Ka doesn't retreat even after being hit by Ian's arrow, it slams its tail into the buildings that the tribe had built. It then sends the two tribe members flying through the air, Vakir immediately leaps down from his home. 
Thinking about how the cow is destroying the home that they had struggled to build, he summons Beelzebub as he hand unleashes that good-looking red aura while telling the cow that he was going to fix that habit of its. The Kir had fully summoned the Beelzebub blade as he lands onto the tree trunk, with a powerful leap forward that smashes the tree trunk into pieces. The Kir lets out the ever so powerful sixth technique of the Baskerville clan, six lurking ambushes, as he soars across the Ka he cuts it six, different ways. The Ka lets out a horrifying roar due to the pain that the Kir caused. He looks back at it to see the damages. The Ka soon retreated back into the swampy waters. Yeah run like a bitch, you ain't nothing for our boy the Kir. The Kir then lands onto a nearby tree and stared at the Ka as it retreats back into the swampy waters. Even the two tribe members were lucky enough to stop themselves from dropping into the waters as they clung onto the tree trunk with all their might. The other tribe members cheered the Kir on as they witnessed him chasing the Ka away. They couldn't believe the number of times that he had saved them. They continued to call the Kir as the Balak's hero, but our boy just felt relieved as he unsummons the Beelzebub sword into his hand. Only the shaman felt annoyed over the heroic feat that Vakir had achieved, but Ahun wore a troubled expression on his face as he thought about something deeply. Ayan, our waifu, was simply starstruck and had fallen even deeper for Vakir's riz as she gave him a thumbs up while thinking that he had passed. She did all this while her mother was watching her from the side. The scene then changes to a tent that was had light and smoke coming from out of it. A plate filled with some delicious looking food was placed on the carpet. Yummy! Our cutie Pipomerian takes a bite onto one of the food that was on the plate. Her face along with Ian's face were both filled with joy over the wonderful flavor that the food had. Pomerian gives her uncle Vakir a thumbs up and tells him that it was yummy. Ian tells her that Vakir was good at cooking, but our boy could only stare at them with a troubled look on his face. He then tells Ian that he couldn't remember inviting her into his house. She tells him that she couldn't just walk past a place where she could smell something yummy. Vakir then tells her that he didn't prepare her share of the food but Ian replies back that whatever belongs to the slave, belongs to the master, so what was Vakir's was also hers. Vakir continues to argue with Ian about her calling him a slave as he had told him many times not to, but Ian continues to remind him to not pay attention to the fine print. As they argue with one another, Pomerian started to think deeply about something. She looks at both Ian and Vakir, telling them both that it felt like they were a married couple, hearing those words made Ian smile and blush. She then grabs onto Pomerian to hug her while rubbing their faces together. She tells Pomerian that she was so cute. Pomerian felt happy with her embrace and could only smile happily. Vakir looks at them and wonders when they had become so close. But a brief breeze of wind enters his tent which causes him to turn around. It turns out that there was someone who had opened the curtain to his tent even though it was raining heavily outside. As Ian held onto Pomerian in her arms. She questions the person who stood at the entrance of their tent about their reason for coming here. It turns out to be a hun. He could be seen breathing heavily as the rain continued to pour heavily onto his body. He then calls out to Vakir in a low voice which startles Ian and made Vakir nervous as a sweat drop appears onto his face. Tears flowed heavily from Ahun's eyes as he tells Vakir that he came here because he thought that it might be possible if it was him. Since Vakir had saved the village multiple times after all, Ahun then starts to beg Vakir telling him please, please. The scene then changes to Ahun's little sister who was gasping for air as she laid on the ground. Ahun finally begs Vakir to please save his little sister. It turns out that she had contracted the red death as its red markings appeared on her face and neck. Thanks for watching the latest part from the voice of Manwa. Subscribe for more content and don't forget to comment below what you want to see in the future. Like and share for more.